R E A R E A R E A R E A Audio Reemployability. Greg, thanks again for coming back. It's part two of our, our two week discussion. Um, you are the executive director of National Star Root Mail Contractors Association. Uh, you're the folks that take the mail from point A to point B, not from mailbox to mailbox, but from like Jacksonville to uh, San Francisco, right? The big over the road drivers. We talked last week about technology and how that's being implemented to make sure the postal service does what it expects to do and, and that's a very very tight schedule and and the organization behind that and how technology is going to help we kind of left off talking about recruitment and the whole transportation industry as a whole it's always been hard to get drivers right but it seems like lately especially these past two years it's it's made it even more difficult so can you talk a little bit about what your organization is doing to try to attract uh, businesses and drivers into what you do and and also a little bit about how we had spoken um, what you do is so generational and and how that affects the human aspect of what you're trying to do sure no I'm, my pleasure todd and thanks again for having me on you know what's really unique about postal service contracting and you, you touched upon it there uh at the end is that it has been dominated by family-run multi-generational businesses for I mean, just for ages, for generations. And you know, the reason why in part is because postal service contracting is unique and it is challenging. So the, the old saying is postal service contracting chooses you, you don't choose postal service contracting because who's gonna sign up for a five minute on-time delivery into a postal facility? And we're not even talking about that final mile, you know, mailbox to mailbox, which you, maybe you have more control over. We're talking about moving at long distances between different sorting facilities different post offices so that that mail ultimately gets down to that home. Um, that's pretty challenging. But, you know, the unique thing also about, you know, the way in which the supplier network has been developed over time um, is that people who move the mail often exclusively move the mail. They don't move anything else. And they take an inordinate amount of pride in the fact mm -hmm. that they are moving the mail. And I think it's not unfair to say that when you're in the business of moving the mail, particularly when you're in the business of exclusively, exclusively moving the mail, they're probably moving some of the most precious cargo in the United States. Because what travels through the mail, sure, it might be catalogs and sure, it might be, you know, marketing mailing, but it's also, you know, letters to loved ones. And it's also uh, bills and it's medicine and it's gifts. And this is what makes the United States network so unique is that you can reach out and touch someone for just pennies, you know, in sending that letter and sending that gift to them. Um, and not to mention anything as important as ballots that go out to people to be filled in and filled out. And so postal service contractors uniquely care about what they move. And I think they probably care about what's in their trailer and what's in the back of their truck more so than maybe any other transportation industry out there. Um, and so, you know, we, we really take a lot of pride in those multi-generational family businesses. And the Postal Service today, you know, counts on them um, in a way in which I don't think any shipper counts on any transportation company. Because if one transportation company leaves, another one can step in. That's just not the same with Postal Service contracting. And so because of those family businesses, though, um, they really impart the pride in the work that we do um, not just from, you know, sort of that CEO or C-suite, um, which often is, you know, mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, but all the way down to the drivers, right? Um, and it's a unique line of work in the transportation industry where you're behind the wheel and you're moving a truck and you're not just moving anything, right? You're moving the mail and it matters in a way in which it, you know, it just doesn't matter elsewhere. I mean, it matters at a constitutional level because the United States has an obligation, the Postal Service has a constitutional obligation to provide this service on a national basis. Um, and so, you know, we're working to support those families who have been in the business a long time, and we're working in part to support them by trying to make it easier to bring drivers um, into this line of work so that they can continue to move the mail for the United States government. 
How are you attracting new drivers? You mentioned the uh, drivers, like transportation is now logistics and it's more sexy than it has been before. Um, we need to attract more drivers to, to make sure we're doing what needs to be done, but we also have to look at safety. And there's been conversations, uh, I've, I've read some articles about standards being lowered, um, 18 year olds being hired to do over the road trucking and um, uh, that, that, it, that offers some concern to some people. So how are you attracting drivers and how are you ensuring that uh, safety is still gonna be a number one priority? So traditionally, the association and the industry at large advocated for higher standards for drivers moving the mail than existed in any other sort of component of the transportation industry. Um, those standards consisted of five years of residency and two years of driving experience. And that meant that someone that was moving the mail was better trained, more reliable, um, and uh, could ensure that the Postal Service continued to meet its obligations. Now, recently, those standards have changed, and they've changed really uh, in large part because of the unique and demanding times that we're in when it comes to uh, supply chain bottlenecks and, and, uh, and the, the need of getting people behind the wheel to continue to move these trucks. Um, but at the same time, Postal Service contracting offers a really unique opportunity for drivers to get the experience uh, behind the wheel without throwing an 18-year-old, you know, in an interstate shipping sort of scenario. They're driving, you know, a Class A truck packed to the roof, you know, um, for the first time uh, throughout the country. And that's because Postal Service contracting does have that long haul component, but it also has regional components where you might be moving mail only interstate within a single state between different postal facilities. And so there is, uh, in some ways, an accessibility to Postal Service contracting that will allow for a, even a younger driver to get the requisite experience they need um, to ensure that there is safety and security and, and reliability. And from there, they can take that experience and move into sort of longer haul trucking and bigger trucks, um, but they're not being thrown into that from the, from the very beginning. And I think that's a big, I think that's a big distinction because when you, when you normally hear about the young driver issue, you're, you're, you're hearing about them in the context of these mega carriers operating mm -hmm. throughout the country where there isn't that stepping stone to more experience. And, and they are being kind of pushed in to fill an urgent need with perhaps, and I, you know, I'm not speaking about any particular trucking company without the requisite experience um, and there was that requisite training to ensure that safety and security. So I think that's the, that's the big difference between us. I'd also just say this, and, and I don't, again, I'm not casting any uh, criticism on, on larger trucking companies or publicly traded co trucking companies, but when you're driving for a multi-generational family business, you're not really just a driver you're actually more so a part of the family than you are an employee. And so th they look at you much more, much differently than you'll be looked at if you're at a big mega carrier or you're a leased owner operator on a big mega carrier. Um, and I think that that difference in perspective means a lot for the steps the owners are gonna take to make sure you're properly trained, but also the steps the owners are gonna take to make sure that you're happy and healthy. And are you, able to have that work-life balance that makes a career in trucking more durable um, than one where you're going to burn out and we're looking to replace you within 12 months, 24 months. Yeah, no, that's, that, that, I don't think that's anybody, anything anybody wants to do right now um, after, after all the training and all that, for sure. Um, you had mentioned the supply chain issues and, and everything that we've kind of endured these past couple of years. What's your take on the supply chain issues? I, you know, I, I certainly don't want to get political in any way, but, but I'm always interested in somebody that works in the industry, right? We hear that prices are up because of supply chain. Like, what is the actual, what does that mean? Like, where are the issues? And what do you think we could have done prior to COVID that might have helped this to not happen? God, that's a huge question. And I think it's probably... <laughs> And you Probably got two minutes. Dollar question. <laughs> yeah. like if I had that answer, I wouldn't be here, right? I'd yeah, be like yeah. on an island somewhere enjoying yeah. myself, right? Is um, there anything that's happened in the past couple of years that you went, oh man, if we'd only done that? 
I don't think there's a silver bullet to this problem. And I think that's why it's so hard for us to wrap our hands around it. There is a confluence of events and factors that have put us in this position today. And unfortunately, I don't think there's an easy or, or near-term exit out of this position. I mean, for years, drivers were sort of treated as expendable. And then we wonder why there is a driver shortage, which mm -hmm. I think is really more fairly characterized as a retention issue, a driver retention issue, not a driver shortage issue. Every year, something like 80,000 people get their CDL licenses. So they could be driving those trucks. They just don't stay in the line of work because it is so challenging and so little support has been provided to them. Now, fortunately, you know, there's a great companies out there. Reemployability is one of them that are taking the steps towards providing employers with the ability to support drivers. And, and it is exciting to see how those companies and technology are going to make this career durable again. At the same hand, we have challenges with uh, obtaining equipment, right? And that, you know, that ultimately on a day-to-day -day basis today, we're talking about chip shortages for these increasingly sophisticated trucks. And that's going to persist for, for the foreseeable future. And that's largely COVID driven. Um, but the reality is that equipment is getting more and more expensive as well. Now, some of the reasons why might ultimately be good. We're concerned about emissions. We want greener equipment on the roads. We want more technologically sophisticated equipment on the roads from a safety perspective. But we have to recognize that with that comes costs. And that means um, you know, it's harder to get those, uh, those vehicles. Um, the potential disruptions to the supply chain in obtaining those vehicles become more numerous. Um, and then those costs get kind of pushed on to the ultimate consumer. And we're running with fewer vehicles on the road. We're, and we're kind of put in a, a position where we're trying to kind of hold it all together with sort of string and duct tape. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's, it's, there's not a single solution, um, but I do think technology is ultimately what's going to deliver the change we need to get back to a new sort of equilibrium that is, that is stable. Um, and that's going to mean, you know, yeah, better, better vehicles, safer vehicles. It's going to mean better train drivers. Um, and ultimately it's going to mean, you know, more autonomous, you know, transportation solutions, maybe not exclusively, or, or uh, exclusively autonomous trucking, but just things that are going to make the supply chain sort of fluid again. Um, and you know, the, I think what we all are wondering is how quickly you know those benefits will be realized. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you know, it, it seems like everything kind of goes back to the economy, and especially in the trucking industry. You're an attorney. You recently wrote an article regarding some changes coming in state laws regarding transportation. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and how it's going to affect the economy? Sure. No, I'm happy to do so. What people don't realize, I think, is the reason why we have the supply chain we do today, where you can get a, a product next day or two days later, three days later, if you're really suffering, right? Um, is because we have consistent laws across the nation. And it's that continuity that allows for the fluid exchange of goods uh, on not only an interstate level, but really on a continental level. I mean, people have to remember that we're not just the United States of America, we are a continental country, you know, from coast to coast. Um, unfortunately, there are states and some policymakers who are advocating for laws that dismantle that uniform, consistent model that allow tr you know, goods and vehicles to seamlessly travel across borders. And I think two of the big issues out there, and we're, and we're seeing them advocated for uh, by any number of states, although I think arguably California is on the leading edge of it, is new environmental regulations, uh, which again, might be uh, well-intentioned, but are poorly planned out. And the other is creating a, a more rigid uh, worker employer or worker company relationships that don't allow for sufficient fluidity in the market. So when we turn to the environmental issues, you know, everyone's concerned about emissions and rightfully so. Um, unfortunately, some people have taken the approach that the only solution is to electrify anything that has, uh, in, that has emissions. Any vehicle on the road has to be electrified. Now, let's put aside the fact that, um, that from well to wheels, electric vehicles today are not actually environmentally friendly. 
But when a state mean, says that you have to operate electric vehicles, that means that the ability of other transportation companies to interact with that state, even though they might be just situated, you know, one mile beyond the border, becomes less and less feasible, it, you know, regardless of whether it's economically feasible, it becomes less and less legally feasible to have that free flow of goods. Um, and so California is, has been at the forefront of advocating for electrification. Other states are following its lead. And if it realizes its goal, suddenly it's going to be increasingly expensive to obtain vehicles all over the country. And it's going to be increasingly expensive to operate fleets that are critical to our modern day supply chain um, in states far beyond California's borders. I mean, and if we look to the second issue, you know, unfortunately, California, again, is at the forefront of this, but there are there is movement at the federal level and there's movement in other states to basically make it all but impossible to be an independent contractor. And that effort is unfortunately not limited to transportation, but its impact is going to be most significantly felt in transportation because the transportation industry is built uh, on the backs of and because of owner operators, particularly when we're looking at long haul transportation and owner operators are sole proprietors. They are their own business uh, you know, people. They have their own companies and it's them and it's the vehicle that they're moving the goods on. Um, it is in many ways uh, you know, a pathway to the American dream and it's something that we should protect and it's been recognized as a critical component of the transportation industry for decades. And yet today, states like California and other states and some federal agencies under the current administration are making it increasingly hard for these owner operators to continue to work with larger fleets or to work with certain shippers because they want to make them employees. And, and when you make them an employee, the cost of having them as part of your business becomes substantially higher and those businesses become substantially less flexible and dynamic and can't respond to the needs of today's demanding supply chain network. Greg, we're running out of time again, but lots of really, really good information. I know we had talked a little bit about um, your organization's role in um, attracting businesses that may be involved or interested rather in transporting the mail. Um, also, some folks might have some questions about some of the legal stuff we chatted about as well and, and supply chain things. What's the best way for people to reach out to you if they have any other questions or if they're interested in, uh, in kind of advancing what it is that they do now into the uh, mail delivery world? Well, I appreciate that, Todd, and this has been a real pleasure. You know, the best way to reach me is at uh, the website for the association, which is nsrmca.org. Or you can just Google the National Star Route Mail Contractors Association. You'll find me and the organization there. I would love to connect with anybody interested in getting part, becoming a part of the Postal Service Supplier Network. I'm um, really interested in, in helping educate people about these significant changes occurring in the transportation industry and what that might mean for their business, what that might mean um, for their opportunity to pursue a successful career. And um, you know, NSRMCA is here to support those people who are uh, interested in in moving the mail, which uh, is today particularly some of the most exciting thing, one of the most exciting things you can be a part of if you ask me. That's great, Greg. And uh, we'll post that in the show notes as well so people can click on it and uh, and reach out to you. So Greg, thanks so much for your time these past couple of weeks. It's been really, really interesting. And uh, if anything comes up in the transportation world that you feel like would be a benefit to risk managers or adjusters or anyone in the workers' comp industry in the future, please reach out. We'd love to hear from you again. Absolutely. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for listening this week to REA Audio. If you have any comments or suggestions for an upcoming episode, please let us know. You can email Todd at reemployability.com. Also, please follow REA Audio on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check out more content at listentorea.com. Well, we have a very special guest next week. Ariel Theodore is a Dynamics Solution Specialist here at Reemployability. Well, what does that mean? It means she's super smart when it comes to IT and technology. Ariel is going to share some insights on technology and the workers' comp industry and what we all need to pay attention to in the years to come. Have a fantastic rest of your week.